welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of the Heal Podcast, I catch up with Dr. David Hamilton. You might remember David from Heal. He was the lovable former organic chemist turned kindness researcher with an amazing Scottish accent. David's scientific background as an organic chemist in the pharmaceutical industry gives him a unique perspective in the world of holistic health. As he developed drugs for cancer and heart disease, he became massively curious and passionate about the placebo effect and the incredible power of our minds. David was so inspired by the placebo effect that he ended up leaving the pharmaceutical industry and went on to write 11 books, most of them about kindness, educating people how they can harness their mind and emotions to improve their mental and physical health. Dr. Hamilton's latest book, Why Woo Woo Works, gives all the scientific research behind various holistic healing modalities like Reiki, meditation, crystals, EFT tapping, and so much more. Bridging the gap between science and spirituality, this book and today's conversation are a gift for skeptics and believers alike. Let's dive in. David, it's so good to see you. It's been too many years. I think it's been uh, like three and a half years. I know. I, I can't believe it. Well, it's great to see you too, Kelly. I'm so pleased to be here, actually. Well, I mean, to be in this e-space yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that we're sharing right now. Right now. It's well, so it's so good. And, and as we find out in your new book, Why Woo Woo Works, you know, there is this, this illusion of separation is mm. just that. It's an illusion. Absolutely. Yeah, can't wait to totally. talk about yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just a little background, you know, David, you were in, um, Dr. David Hamilton was one of the brilliant experts in HEAL. Uh, and I would love for you to just tell the audience a little bit about your history, because I think I have so many great um, questions for you based on your background of being an organic chemist in the pharmaceutical industry and then kind of your awakening to the disconnect between the intention of really wanting to help and heal through technology and chemistry um, and, and where that falls short. Yeah, well, I, you know, for, for me, uh, so I, I, I worked as an organic chemist, that was my PhD. It's like Lego, but instead of using plastic blocks of different shapes and sizes and colors, uh, as your building blocks, you use atoms as your building blocks, but the idea is the same. So we don't build, you know, cars and rocket ships like children with Lego blocks do. We build, you know, molecules which become uh, medicines. And and when I, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, I think my interest in the placebo effect, which really catalyzed my my decision to leave the industry, actually was was born. When I was 11 years old, funnily enough, my mom, my, my mom had, it was suffering from postpartum depression after the youngest of my three sisters. So I have three sisters and the youngest was born in 1976 and my mom developed postpartum depression. Now, it wasn't really understood very well in the 70s. In fact, one of the pieces of advice my mom was given was give yourself a shake. You know, asking a woman with postpartum depression to give herself a shake, that's like asking someone with a, a broken knee to just run it off and it'll be fine. And so my mum suffered really, she really struggled. And when I was 11 years old, I just started high school. And I was in the school library, and as odd as it might sound, a book fell off the shelf. I mean, you know, as woo as that sounds, a book fell off the shelf. And it was called The Magic Power of Your Mind by a, an author called Walter Germain. And I just knew that that book would help my mum. So I just put it in my bag and I didn't know you're supposed to join a library, you know, and check a book out. I just put it in my bag. We still have, we still have the book. Oh my God. <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, it didn't cure depression of my mum in a day, but you know, it taught her tools and strategies like, you know, meditation and positive affirmations that didn't cure her at the time, but they helped her to navigate a course through 
some of the difficult times. So as I was growing up, as I, you know, you know, eight, nine, ten, then into my teenage years, my mom and I would often talk about the, the power of the mind from what she'd learned in the books. So it became so fascinating, these conversations we had. So when I ended up working with one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, when all of my colleagues were celebrating the X percent a, or, of effectiveness of the drug, all I could see was the Y percent effectiveness of the placebo. And I was like, wow, look how many people are improving on a sugar pill. So I began to research that. So I, I spent a lot of my own time as a, a professional scientist when I was doing my own job in normal days. I spent a lot of my spare time researching the mind-body connection and understanding how is it that mind and emotions can cause a physical effect in the brain uh, and in the body. And after a, about four years, you know, I was involved in developing uh, medicines for cardiovascular disease and cancer. But for me, understanding and harnessing that bridge between the mind and the body was much more interesting. Uh, and so I, I just left the industry and I, I thought I, I was passionate about helping people because under using your own mind and emotions is something anyone can do, you know, just understanding how that works. And I thought there's plenty of people doing the science that I was doing, but there's hardly anyone doing educating people in the mind-body connection. So that was really part of my catalyst, my catalyst out of the industry. Amazing. And you now have compiled this new book, which I love the title because I'm a huge alliteration fan. <laughs> it's called Why Woo Woo Works. And, you know, arguably you compared organic chemistry to, uh, you know, kids playing with Legos, but you're playing with atoms, you know, but I don't know what the age <laughs> you know, requirement for organic chemistry is because it's like just super smart and above where, you know, Legos are whatever, but yeah. um, I love that analogy. But anyway, oh, so why we will works is you, you have this mind. I mean, you, you can understand chemistry and physics and, and mathematics, and, and we get a little taste of that in the book, but you back up all of these kind of fringe therapies or complementary uh, therapies and uh, modalities like Reiki and energy medicine and breath work and meditation and, uh, you know, EFT, EMDR, like all of these things that I've dabbled in. And you, you bring the science and the evidence-based research to back up why they work. And I think it's so great because it's marrying, you know, spirit and science. And so tell us a little bit about your book, how, you know, how long it took you to do the research, uh, what your, you know, what your hope for it is, et cetera. It, well, it, it, it took me about a year and a half, actually. Do you know, it's the first book that I've, oh, I've written 11 books, and it's the first book that I've not written the entirety of in a coffee shop. <laughs> so all my other books, I would go to coffee shops at about 7.30 in the morning and work usually till about lunchtime. And that's how I do most of my book writing. But I started working on this book just a few months before the pandemic began. And, and so I, I wasn't in coffee shops, so I, I, I had to learn how to work at home. And I, 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 I found it a little difficult at first, and I think it, caught, it made me take a little bit longer than I would normally do. So normally I would write a book cover to cover in less than a year. This one took about 18 months. But I, I, I so enjoyed it, though. It was such an... Because I, I think one of my motivations was... I, I, I have myself experience the benefits of, of complementary holistic therapies. And, and I, I've, you know, years ago, I took, I trained in Reiki. I even dabbled in crystals years ago. And, and I, I know that these things have an effect. And, and I noticed also that so many people are skeptical of these subjects. And they're not skeptical because they're experts in the subjects and they know that something, whether something is true, is it true or not. But you find most people are skeptical because they're not experts. And they actually don't know if the subject is true or not. It just doesn't sound plausible to them. So uh, these subjects, like complementary therapies, holistic therapies, energy work and all that, is often dismissed as woo-woo. Not because it actually is woo-woo, but just because people don't fully understand it. So I thought, well, I'm going to dive into the hard science. I'm going to pull it all out. And, and there's, lo there's loads and loads and loads of science out there. And I thought, I'm just going to pull it out and, and explain uh, how it works and also provide some of these scientific research studies that, that further, uh, you know, 
show how it works. So I, I talked, I, I covered, you know, the lower end of woo woo, starting with subjects that, you know, people at least have some degree of, of acceptance of, like, you know, meditation, visualization, even the, I, I explained how the placebo effect works, exactly how it actually works, you know, what the bridge between mind and body is. And then I went into things like trapped and released emotion. But even the healing power of nature, you know, why hospital pay, why people recover faster in a hospital if their window of, if their window offers them a view of nature versus a brick wall, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and then I covered you know Reiki biofield therapies. I even talked about different ways that crystals can impact us, and then dived into consciousness perception, how perception might shape reality, uh, and even how how things like distant healing and telepathy, prayer might actually work and, and what the magical ingredient for all of these things are. So I covered quite a lot. You did. <laughs> and and it's so interesting because, the, you know, the placebo effect really is kind of everything. I mean, it shows us that, you know, this intrinsic health that we have within us and this ability to heal and our innate healing response that's constantly healing us in every moment. Um, and this placebo the power of the placebo is everything. And it's truly, if we believe and expect and visualize, you know, uh, it, it triggers this cascade of, of chemicals, healing chemistry, or, you know, if it's the nocebo, then it's the opposite stress chemistry, um, disease chemistry into our bodies. So just knowing, so for these skeptics out there or people that aren't sure, like what the hell is Reiki? I've had it done, but it's so hard to quantify, like if it's actually working because, it's invisible. Um, you know, you're giving real tangible studies so that people, so it, for me, it, it just strengthens people's belief, which then of course powers the treatment even more. It's like a supercharger. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I just, it's such a gift because the people that kind of resonate with it naturally, but then need that extra scientific research to go, no, this is real, you know, so that I can show this to my husband who's a skeptic or my mother yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just a, such a gift that you're giving, but talk yeah. to us a little bit about the placebo and belief. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the most fascinating things about the placebo effect, or you might reframe it as the, 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 the physiological effect of belief is that biochemistry in the brain and the body very often follow your mind. They follow the direction of your mind. So if your mind is over there, then biochemistry will follow it. In other words, if you think about some, someone that you have issues with so, or someone who causes you stress, then because your mind is over there, then the biochemistry of the body, the brain and body will follow you, i.e. stress hormones will be developed in response to where your mind is going. But if you think of someone you care about, and, and, and feel how that feels to, to appreciate someone's presence in your life, some of the things that nice things they might have done, and your mind goes over there. Then the body, the brain, and the body's biochemistry follow you, and you start producing, I call them kindness hormones, really to, to draw a parallel between uh, the stress hormones and kindness hormones are both produced because of how a, a thought feels. So a stressful thought feels stressful, and we produce stress hormones. A kind thought feels gentle and kind so we produce kindness hormones and so the biochemistry follows your mind so when you believe something the exact same thing happens in this case this time uh, the the brain and the body produce what substances they need to produce to deliver what you believe is supposed to happen so for example what's really well known in placebo research is if a person gets a, a placebo that they think, well, they believe will remove their pain, then the brain actually produces natural painkillers, its own version of morphine and heroin. So the brain produces a natural, a natural opiates, you know, so morphine and heroin are, called, are opiate drugs. So the brain produces natural, safe versions that really, that are, the, another, that, that's the, body, the brain and body's a desire almost to follow what you're, believing. So I believe this pain will go away. So the brain produces what it needs to produce to deliver that result to meet my expectations. So just like stress or kindness, the biochemistry of the brain and the body follow the direction of your mind. And that, that really underpins the entirety of the mind-body connection. Wherever your mind goes, the, bi the body's biochemistry follows it in whichever direction it flows in. 
Uh, which is why, guys, you don't want to jump on Google right after you get a diagnosis because <laughs> exactly. your mind is going to go to really dark yeah. places. And yeah, yeah. I always start on like page seven or eight because the first <laughs> few pages are bought and paid for. I love that. Um, so just personal, you know, I, I, I think of you and I think of this placebo effect and, I, you know, I, I tend to avoid even Advil unless it's, you know, usually when I have a headache, it's because I drank too much wine or I'm dehydrated, something that I'm like aware of. It's not some mystery why I've had the headache. Um, so I usually just hydrate and rest and, and try to do things naturally. And if it persists, um, you know, then I will take Advil if it's persisting after, you know, eight hours or something. Yeah. But kind of do you have, have you figured out the trick? Like, tell me for people like me, like, how do you, cause I, I, I understand. I'm like, okay, if I believe and expect that this cracker or whatever this, you know, innate substance, inert substance, this, you know, quote unquote sugar pill will be, I believe that will take, I believe and expect it'll take my pain away. Um, have you cracked that code? Are you able to do that for yourself? Yeah, well, well uh, ultimately what, what we need to learn is how do I switch on belief? And, and so what we actually need is a little procedure that we found works for us in the past. And then you follow the procedure. I'll give you an example. This actually explains how, did you know that placebos work just as well if, they're, if a person gets a bottle of pills and it says placebo on it? If you give a person a placebo and it says placebo and it also says take two pills twice a day, it still works just as well as a blind placebo. And the reason why is because we've had a lifetime of experience that says I have a headache, so I will click open the bottle of tablets. I will take these two pills with a glass of water. And the, the weight of that experience, mm. the belief that comes with that we've learned that comes with that produces the brain's natural painkillers. So, it, it, so it's just a little, it's like a little ritual that we do that's actually doing the work. We don't need the Advil in it. In this, in this example, it, it's a ritual itself. You could put anything in there. Yeah. You know, well, in this context, it is actually a placebo. And the bottle of pills even says placebo. But the weight of that experience, that ritual, is stronger than your short-term knowledge that it's just a placebo. So what we have to develop then is little rituals. Here, here's a good one. We can use visualization. So I, I was about to do a radio show a few years ago, and I was chatting with the producer just before it. And she was a 28-year-old woman who'd suffered since she was a young child with, a, with childhood rheumatoid arthritis, which was causing her so much pain mm -hmm. when she was a child. And she said her life really changed when a, 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 a young nurse feeling empathy for her pain, said to her, the young girl was saying, oh, it takes so long, I'm so much pain in my hands and stuff. And the nurse said, see, when you take this, notice when it dissolves in the water. When you take this, imagine all those little particles, or the little smiley faces, even though you can't see them, those little particles of white in the water. Imagine that those are little smiley faces and they're trying to help you. So she said, when you drink it like that, imagine them now, flowing through your body and going right up to where the pain is actually focused. And she did that. And the pain just disappeared instantly, literally in a, in a second. And she said, I've been doing that every single time. And here I am at 28 years old. And she said, I couldn't wait to, to, uh, to speak to you on the radio because I knew what you were coming on to talk about. And I just wanted to, so I, I, got, I, I took the producer's job tonight just so that I could tell you what I did. And I thought, isn't that amazing? And, and, so, and so she said, even as a 28-year-old woman, whenever I have pain, all I have to do is that little visualization. It's a ritual itself. It's the, it's the repetition of the ritual that works like visualization begins to train our brain circuits. And she says it's repetition over several years of that little ritual that the moment I think about it, I, I see the movement of the little, of the little smiley faces and they don't mean me any harm. They're smiley faces. They're going and they're, they're just neutralizing. They're just going to, and they're neutralizing the pain. Mm. And so sometimes what we have to find is a little ritual. So if I have a pain, does it help me to take three breaths? Or does it help me to take a green juice? Or does it help me to stop and think kindness? Because one of the things that amplifies pain is feeling stressed about something. Physiologically speaking, the opposite of stress is kindness. It's how kindness feels. It generates the opposite, the exact 
opposite neurological and physiological effects of, of stress. So if stress is, exam is amplifying pain, then you can guarantee that kindness will reduce it. So maybe the ritual can be, I feel a little bit of pain, I'll take a few breaths, and now I'm going to think of someone I care about. And just for a few moments, I'm going to really feel how it feels when I think about how much that person has made a, a lovely contribution to my life. I'll think about the last thing they said or did for me that really felt so nice and sweet. And, and that physiologically, neurologically, is the opposite of stress. So that could be the ritual for, within reason for, for, for many people. Amazing. Yeah, you've written many books on the uh, healing effects of kindness and love, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The oh five, gosh. the five side effects of kindness was was my uh, attempt to turn around the notion of a negative side effect because we think of a side effect as the negative side effects of a drug, but a side effect is really just something that happens alongside the thing that you're intending. So I rebranded side effect by showing that there are five positive side effects of kindness that are yeah. really good for us. And a lot of the people that I've spoken to, you know, people that have run mind body medicine clinics. A lot of times when people aren't healing, but they're doing all the protocols, um, they kind of discovered that they were focusing too much on themselves and their condition. And so to take one of the antidotes, one of the remedies was to take the attention off yourself and actually give service to others, be kind to others, because that is that missing healing, uh, yeah. you know, ingredient to your own journey. Your attention is Absolutely. too focused on yourself and you need to be kind to someone else and, and kind of serve. Wonderful. So, cool. so just real quick, because you mentioned that you did your PhD and then you went into developing drugs for cardiovascular disease. And then I remember, you know, talking about how kindness uh, is kind of the antidote for like, talk to me a little bit about, you know, personality and emotion and different than cancer and heart disease. And, mm. and, and then also um, the healing powers of kindness. Cause I love that visual yeah. where you're saying it's like, it actually like oxytocin and these other, um, you know, healing chemicals can, can chemistry can actually like clean your, out your arteries and reverse yeah. cardiovascular disease. So talk to us a little about, I know that was a big broad question as well, but no, no, I, I, I absolutely personality, get it. emotion and disease. Yeah. So, so what, one of the things that, that researchers noticed even, even about 20, 30 years ago, but it was kind of dismissed as woo woo is that there was in some cases, a correlation between personality type and particular diseases. So for example, there was a strong correlation between type C personality, which is a cooperative unassertive, suppresses negative emotion and the thickness of some tumours. And so looking at statistics, you tend to find that a cancer is more, you know, it doesn't mean that type C personality causes cancer. It just meant that given, you know, different personality styles have different, different personality types have different coping styles and therefore different degrees of stress about different things. So add that to the cauldron amid you know, genetic predisposition among environmental factors and a whole other things, put them all in the cauldron. And statistically, you'll find that cancer might more readily brew. Some types of cancer might more readily brew in a type C personality cauldron. Similarly, you find that cardiovascular disease will more readily brew in a cauldron that has a part of what's called type A personality. And the part of that, not the whole type A, but the part is hostility and aggression. So people who are high in hostility and aggression have higher incidences of cardiovascular disease. Now, here's the thing that comes back to kindness, because kindness and love and compassion, because of how they feel to us, they feel nice. We produce not stress hormones like when we feel stress, we produce kindness hormones. Now, one of the most important kindness hormones, oxytocin, also called the love drug, the hugging hormone, the cuddle chemical, it has a number of affectionate names. I call it the kindness hormone to add to that, uh, to that library of, of terms. I, but one of the most amazing things that it does is, is it, it, it softens the walls of our blood vessels and it, it, it releases the tension in the walls of the blood vessels. And, that, and so the, the blood vessels go like that. 
and they expand. They probably make that noise as well if you really <laughs> listen. But it goes like that. And it means the heart doesn't have to work quite as hard to push the blood and the, the blood through. So the heart eases off some of its pressure. And what you get is a reduction in blood pressure. So kindness hormones are called cardioprotective because they protect the, the cardiovascular system. And some other research shows that two of the main uh, groups of precursors to cardiovascular disease, like inflammation and free radicals, are actually cleaned out by the kindness hormone. It's like the kindness hormone goes through with a big hose and cleans all the blood vessels down, or it, it goes out with a sweeping brush and it just sweeps all the debris out and it keeps the blood vessels clean and healthy. And, you know, this actually explains one of my favorite all-time statistics. Yeah, you know, I, I love animals, I, particularly because I lost my dog a few years ago. Oscar, he was a, a yellow Labrador. He was only two years old and he had bone cancer. But get this, the chances of a second heart attack within one year in someone who's had a heart attack already, so a person who's already had a heart attack, the chances of another within a year, if they have a dog, is 400% less. 400% less. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that that's due to the exercise you get for walking the dog. Of course, that plays a role, but it's not the only role. Front page in one of the top scientific journals in the world a few years ago, picture of a yellow Labrador, looked very like my Oscar. And uh, scientists were measuring levels of the kindness hormone in real time as they were produced while uh, people interacted warmly lovingly and playfully with their dogs. And amazingly, levels of the kindness hormone increased at a rate of 10% per minute over 30 minutes. Not 10% in total, no. 10% per minute over the 30 minute study, a greater than 300% increase in levels of the kindness hormone. Now we know that it's extremely cardioprotective. So that is one of the, so one of the reasons why the chances of a second heart attack in a year in someone who's had one already, if they have a dog, isn't just the exercise that you get from taking the dog for the walk. It's the love and affection and the warmth and playfulness that you, and that you have from interacting with the dog consistently all through the day lifts up your levels of the kindness hormone, which is lo expanding your blood vessels, lowering your blood, fresh, blood pressure and cleaning out all your arteries all throughout the day. That's why, as well as the exercise, that statistic it holds. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. The power it's of amazing. kindness and love. and oh, Yeah, there's so much fascinating I, um, research around dogs, too, especially because yeah. they're so, but any, any loving animal, but dogs are, you know, this, this poster child of unconditional love. And often they, which I think is so interesting in your case, I don't know that this applies since poor Oscar was so young. But oftentimes they take on, um, they manifest certain conditions because they are literally self-sacrificing and soaking up the energetic field that may have been meant for someone else. You know, yeah. it's wild. Do you know, I, I can absolutely relate to this, Kelly. It's something actually I haven't really probably shared very often, but just in the context of what you just said, you know, o Oscar... He, he had anxiety issues when he was young and all through his life. Now, I've always had anxiety. I've struggled with anxiety all through my life. Even, even now, I, I just, even as an adult, even writing about the mind-body connection doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory and great all the time. I, I, one of my main struggles in life, even now, is, is managing anxiety when it comes up. I notice when it comes and I don't worry so much because I know it will pass. And I, I know what certain triggers are. It, it, ju it just comes and goes and, and I'm okay with it. But Oscar manifested anxiety. And he really, struck, you know, Oscar had this thing. He couldn't even cross the threshold of the, of the step, even though the step was only that size. And sometimes he would bark at it and, and he would need to be lifted over the threshold. And other little anxiety things that he had. But here, here's another thing. You know, it, Oscar arrived in my life two days before I started working on what was now one of my best-selling books, I Heart Me. So I Heart Me, The Science of Self-Love. Oscar arrived in my life two days before I started working on that book, and he passed away two days before I finished it. 
He was in my life for the entirety, exactly to the day, the exact number of days I worked on, on that book. Yeah. I have crazy now, chills. I mean, this is, you talk about, I mean, synchronicity. Yeah. Like you have some fascinating stories that you, obviously that one is the most fascinating. Um, and we all have these fascinating encounters that we're just like, whoa, I have angels or whoa, what a gift or whoa, that could not have been a coincidence, you know, coincidence. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about synchronicity. I mean, the book falling off the shelf that helped your mom through postpartum and sent you on this journey. Uh, then the EMCE equals MC squared book that just happened to be in the book, uh, box of books that you, you know, that you wrote about and why we works. So if we get to it today, yeah. e amazing. I would love for you to share it. If, if we don't, you know, everybody has to pick up this book to find out the story. It's so, so crazy. I love yeah. synchronicity. So talk to us about synchronicity. Yeah, well, I, I think, Everything is, is deeply interconnected. And so one of the things I, I write about in the book is that uh, everything, I believe that everything is part of the same uh, infinite, unbounded consciousness, a field of consciousness. Uh, and that, that's what I, I believe. And that, for me, accounts for all the research in the field of psi, telepathy, ESP, prayer, all that kind of stuff. So, so I'm quite open about that in the book, that my belief is that that must be true or that is more likely to be true than the idea that we have in the mainstream that consciousness is locked inside your skull so i given the fact that there's a vast field of statistics that show that psi prayer etc is actually real and it does actually work there is a small but measurable effect then it must be true that consciousness is perhaps something more fundamental so within that Ever, I believe that everything is interconnected to everything else, but certain people and events are more interconnected. And it's like, as Jung wrote, Carl Jung wrote, that people and events literally fall together in time like snowdrops. But they're not necessarily snowdrops falling side by side, but they could be snowdrops following one over there and one over here, which might be in time. So what? So there are people that you're entangled with, events that you're entangled with, connected to, that are ahead of you in time, and they fall together. So, so what happens is it's an, it seems like there's an invisible force pulling you to a particular time and space or to a particular person because you're already connected to them mm -hmm. in that unbounded, infinite field of consciousness. So, so that's how I think synchronicity actually works. It's that there are people and events that you're much more connected to than other people and events. And so there's a, it seems as if there's a hidden force, but really what that is, it's a, it's a, a it's the way that channels or, or currents of consciousness organize events and circumstances and just guide people to turn left instead of right one day, or just guide us to stop for an extra few seconds or walk a little bit faster or, or do something or do something else. But there is an organization of events and circumstances as they fall together in time, like two snowdrops falling together in, in time. And I think that's synchronicity works on that basis only because everything by definition is deeply interconnected to everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like quantum entanglement or yeah, yeah. entanglement theory. So this is what Albert it, Einstein believed. Yeah. You know. Except I would say that, you know, Quantum entanglement is a physical phenomena. One of the things I've, I've wrote in the book is that, and why WooWoo works, is that if, if it is true that there is a, a single, unified, unbounded consciousness that is the foundation of reality, it's called non-duality in the East. In the West, in, in academic philosophy, they call it idealism, but it's the same idea, idealism uh, and non-duality as they, they've always talked about Nice, it's the same rough idea. And it means there's a single unbounded consciousness and that reality itself is an appearance of consciousness. So you're an appearance of consciousness. I'm a different appearance of the same consciousness. Even a blade of grass is an appearance of consciousness. A good analogy might be white light will shine through a raindrop or raindrops and that gives you a rainbow up in the sky. But the, the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, they might believe themselves, if they were people, they would believe themselves to be separate. But they're just different appearances of the same white light.
They're just different ways that the white light is appearing right now. So people and reality are just appearances of consciousness appearing in all different shapes and sizes and forms. But if that's true, then the laws of physics themselves must also be appearances of consciousness. So underneath that, therefore, there must also be, or probably is, laws of consciousness of which the laws of physics are just appearances of. And so I think the quantum entanglement, even though it sounds woo-woo to say so, is also an appearance of consciousness. So therefore, there must be an entanglement in consciousness itself with any field of consciousness that is responsible for the phenomena of synchronicity. Mm. Thank you. Um, I totally, totally agree. I would never be able to articulate it as well as you do, but on a resonant level, that's that I totally agree. And I almost feel like oh, thank you. it's almost as if there's parallel, there's w w this field of infinite possibility and potentiality, right? So there's this version of Kelly that you're looking at right now in this, and, and say I was dealing with something like blinking off in another, like there's all these parallel dimensions where there's another version of Kelly where these things that I desire, whether it's say I had a disease and I wanted to be healthy Kelly and that's over here uh, or pregnant Kelly or, you know, president of America, Kelly, whatever, whatever that desire is like that potential exists. And it, it's a matter of aligning your consciousness to then align with that potentiality so that it expresses. Does that make sense? And then Absolutely. also on a level of, I, I don't know what, if it's atoms or quanta, or it's like they're flashing on and off. And so there's like this moment of on off. And like between that moment, there's that decision of potential, like and possibility. And we could, so we can literally just get down to that quantum level and shift our reality very quickly. Mm. So, talk, yeah, so does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it's actually how I, I've looked at the world for, for many, many years. And in physics, the, one of the most popular uh, interpretations of quantum physics, and I say interpretations because uh, in quantum mechanics, we don't know exactly what is the foundational uh, understanding of why things work the way they do. And one of the leading contenders for the understanding is called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's called the many worlds. And along the main interpretation that most physicists have gone for is called the Copenhagen interpretation after uh, the theory was put together in, in Copenhagen in the years of Niels Bohr and Einstein and all that many, many, uh, many years ago. But one of the leading contenders is the many worlds. And the many worlds interpretation says that at every moment of decision, the world breaks up into two possibilities. So every time you're about to make a decision, Kelly, or have an idea, the world splits in half and splits in half and splits in half. And there are an infinite number of Kellys right now having an infinite number of... Now, if it's, like you wind back, your own, it's like a choose your own adventure book yeah, from my childhood. Yeah, and, and so personally... In my understanding of, of, of physics, you know, I'm actually uh, most of the way through, although I have got a degree in chemistry and a PhD in chemistry, I've also been studying mathematics and physics formally at university level. I'm close to the end of that, of that degree. So I, I do understand the mathematical basis of, of some aspects of quantum mechanics and stuff. Uh, and the many worlds theory is the one that, that has most aligned with how I understand the world. Now, if we were to come back and say that is a, an appearance of consciousness, then at the level of consciousness itself, yes, an infinite number of Kellys exist. One is the president, one is pregnant, one is achieving this, one is doing that, and all these things. And, and I believe that the challenge in life is to hold the idea of what you want and the feeling of it most clearly and consistently. And the key is consistency. You've got to keep consistently focusing. And then it doesn't mean that tomorrow you'll be the president. But what happens is you start to move if that was your goal. But it means that you start to move in that direction. So one of the analogies I use in the book is you're on a big wide river and you have a small, a small boat and you have a paddle. And the paddle represents your, your thoughts and your feelings and your beliefs and your actions. Now, what many people do is we paddle a little bit that way. And then we paddle a little bit that way. And then we paddle, then we go around in a little circle. And most people just randomly all over the place. And also the river has a current. 
that we don't notice. Sometimes there's a wind blowing. Sometimes the current is very gentle. Other times it's very strong. And let's face it, sometimes you smack into the rapids and spiritual teachers say to us, you've just got to let go. Let go, go with the flow of these in, at those times. But when the river is generally calm and you do feel empowered, then I think when we hold an intention, hold a belief, an idea, that something that, that a, part, a sense of purpose, something that's compelling for you, you take a little paddle in that direction and then you hold that idea again and you take a little paddle and you consistently hold it. Then after a period of time, you might have gone a mile or five miles down the river, but eventually you realize, damn it, I'm actually at the right bank. I've actually got to the other side. That was my goal. Kelly, the president, was, you know, <laughs> 10 miles, 10 miles down the river of life, like 10, meaning 10 years down the river of life. Mm -hmm. But it was my gradually, ever so gently, but consistently paddling here, that in the river of time, in 10 years, i.e. 10 miles in the river, I have gradually, somehow, even though at times there was a current pulling me there, and sometimes the rapids, and sometimes a whirlwind spun me right round, and I went, and it was all over the place, but I just kept consistently paddling, and, and sometimes I get thrown over here, but I kept consistently paddling, and it wasn't just a straight line then, it was more of a kind of zigzag all over the place, and I sunk for a little while, and I was trying to get back up, and, but I just kept paddling. And then 10 years of paddling in the river of, the river of time, here I am, Kelly, the president, for example, I've reached that bank. And that's how I think, it, within the context of waves and different things happening in life, it's the consistency that, that causes you to flip through all these real Kelly many worlds, all these different versions of Kelly. You, you actually start fl like a, flicking a deck of cards or flicking pages of a book and each page is a different Kelly, and you start flicking through, flicking through, flicking through, and you're focused, and there's the present Kelly, the presence at the end, but you just keep flicking through, flicking through, and you keep focusing, and you flick through all these probabilities of different versions of Kelly, versions of reality, by paddling, and you eventually get to the one that you're looking for. So that's how I think that works. So I totally agree with you. And I, I, it's so interesting too, because I, I often like joke, like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, which is one of, I don't know if it's global, but the United States. Yeah, is like I, our I know that one. Yeah. I'm like that, like that says it all. That's one of the most profound writings ever because yeah. gently down the stream, so many people are paddling upstream until, you know, the, paddling upstream, meaning, you know, they're in a job that they were, were pressured into getting. It's not flowing downstream of what their soul came here to do. So they're paddling mm. upstream until they like, you know, get knocked off their feet with exhaustion or an injury or an illness or something. So I do, I love that. I love that metaphor. Um, and so I actually have it written down the river metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, real I love quick how you look at the world because I, that, that is fun. I, I like how you use that all these different versions of Kelly, because that's the way I've intuitively always looked at the world. And when I was studying the, the mathematical foundations of, of quantum mechanics in my university studies, uh, I, I, I was lit up. I just loved the idea of the many worlds because I'd always intuitively felt something like that. And then to see the, that it is one of the leading contenders for the proper understanding of the foundations of, of quantum physics. Yeah. So, and that's why I, yeah. I, I, it also helps me in that those times where there's a decision, especially if someone is on a healing journey, which I want you to kind of say that metaphor one more time for someone listening that's on a healing journey, because rather than Kelly to the US president, because that's yeah, unlikely. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe uh, there was a. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. but it's funny that I mentioned that. Um, but for, you know, it's there's so much pressure sometimes, especially if you're on a healing journey, that I'm going to make the wrong decision. And I'm going to end up the wrong place or the place I don't want to be, which is, you know, down the place I don't want to be. So, yeah, because you can all, if you've gone over that side, you can always recognize, oh, I'm there. I'm going to, I need to go, I need to paddle yeah. over there. And, and if you, you trust, can, if you're going with the flow with some yeah. paddles, even if you paddle to the wrong side of the thing, as long as you're in the current of life, in the higher current of consciousness of which you came born into this world that has a connection to your soul and your soul's purpose, as long as you're paddling gently downstream, you may 
hit a rock, you may have paddled the wrong direction for a period of time, but as long as you surrender and you're going with the flow, you can't make a wrong decision, right? You're yeah. going to end up where you're putting your attention and you just have to have the discipline to just keep focusing on it, keep trusting that the current of consciousness, the life, the universe, God is flowing you in that right direction. Um, and then just keep doing the daily paddles and the work yeah. that you need to do to that's aligned with your destination. Yeah. And, and, and one of the ways I, I think to, to tap into, there's a, 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 an underlying deeper current there. And I think it's a current of well-being, of spiritual well-being. And, and it's, it's driven by the, 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 thing, the fact that consciousness is infinite, unified, and unbounded. Uh, and I think that un, there's an underlying current of well-being, and I mean spiritual well-being, and the way to tap into that, and that sense of everything's okay, is to, to practice compassion and kindness. And empathy and, and love, just like what, what you said you said earlier. Sometimes we focus too much on the details, what's happening to me, and now we need to look outside. And what I've noticed is, when you start e exercising on purpose as often as you can, compassion for people's difficulties and challenges and suffer and suffering, and empathy uh, and kindness when you can, and, and just try to be what you know in your heart you are a, a good person. And practice it, be that, not just in physical practice, but in your mind and how you think about people. I've noticed that you seem to tap into the, the, pro, the real direction of that flow, the direction of that current, the undercurrent towards spiritual well-being, towards a, an emotional sense of I've got this. And even though the current seems to be going here, I, I kind of know that it's actually going over there eventually. And I just need to do this little twist here. But what helps you navigate it is tapping into the deeper aspect of the current. And I think we, it's compassion and empathy and kindness and love that gets us there, not just in the little daily things that you, we do, but more, more than that, in how we think about people. How we, when you, when you, you, you talk about a person, do you talk about them with compassion and understanding or do we get angry? Do you, when you think about a person, do you think about a person, and even though you might have an issue, do you say, I, I know that that person, everyone, we're all having struggles in life. I have them as well. And it's okay to not have, to, it's okay to not be okay. If that's true for me, it's also true for another person. So for me, I try to practice giving people the benefit of the doubt. And it's not easy all of the time, but we keep we make these little adjustments to our paddle if we try to the to the best of our ability align our thinking with the flow, not just with the flow of I want to heal my body or be this that or the next thing, but I want to heal. I want to be part of the single unbounded infinite unified consciousness, and the way to do that is through compassion and empathy and kindness and, and love. Because the source of consciousness that that energy that current is love right is absolutely a love that yeah. surpasses human understanding if yeah if you know that's your spiritual belief which it, it totally is mine um yeah and, 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 and yeah. i sorry on you go on you go, go ahead go ahead no go ahead no I, I was just saying you know years ago i used to intellectually talk about that kind of thing but over the years of putting my words into practice myself I've had more of the felt experience of that. So when I'm talking about it now, I'm not just intellectualizing. It's the felt experience of noticing that things just seem to flow a little bit better when your motivation is based in compassion and kindness and empathy and love and that kind of thing. So it's more what eventually the practice gives you the felt experience of it. And then you just sort of, you have like a knowing it's not an intellectual knowing. You just sort of kind of know it's okay. Yeah. No matter what, it's okay. Kind Something of else that helps me with this concept, because like you said, having compassion, even for the people that, you know, may be triggering you or teachers in your life or nightmares in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked about crystals and, and how, you know, eat like fractals. And how, like, so there's this concept of the universe or God consciousness 
each of us is a little fractal of the greater whole. So each of us is a way for God, for the universe consciousness to understand itself a little more. So for instance, yeah. this person in my life that is just like causing me my only stress and challenges in this world right now, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a task, but I have to come back to having compassion for this person. Uh, and obviously I intellectually understand that, you know, this person had some trauma in their childhood and they're just a product of how they were raised and their ancestry and whatever um, and, and years of choices and behaviors. And like, so I can intellectually be like, I need to be compassionate for this person, but to really get to the feel, <laughs> it's so hard to get to the feeling of that is to know that like, it's so intelligent, whether you call it God or the universe that it, it literally the, you know, these snowflakes falling in time together, come to show you different facets of yourself so that through other people, through experiences, so that you can heal, which is coming back to wholeness. And the more of us that can come back to wholeness through this experience, it's like, that's the expansion and the evolution that the universe or God needs because wow. they're, they're experiencing yeah. through us, you know? So that's what gets me back to, even though I want to like scream and shout and punch and, you know, throw this person to Pluto, um, you know, it just goes, okay, this is, this is an aspect of my shadow that's coming to, to reflect back to me, the parts that are not whole. And mm. this person is just a reflection of that. And I think what I've understood is that the universe, all of us are a way that God is understanding itself or the universe intelligence, whatever yeah. terminology is, does that yeah. make sense? And can you articulate it better? I, I, I don't think I could articulate that any better. You just, I was just, I wanted to stop there, but I didn't want to stop you because I, I thought, I just love how you've articulated that. And I just wanted to say that while you were talking, I thought, I don't want to interrupt your flow because that's one of the best articulations of that I've ever heard. So, uh, you know, I, I'm silent here. I've, I've got nothing. Ah, thank you. Okay, good. Well, awesome. I just feel like, you know, um, hopefully people followed the thread of what I would, but I, I want to put out, because it's, it's so refreshing to talk to you because I feel like you can understand things in a mathematical sense that, and can articulate it and you you know how to do the research or analyze the research to support these things because they're just they're just they're just resonant concepts in my in my experience in my spiritual mm. understanding so for you to kind of align with that is really affirming to me and really just validates what i believe so thank you well i thank you thank you you know i've always felt that my purpose or one of my my purposes is to take concepts and and subjects that people don't really understand and to find a way of articulating them in a way that the average everyday ordinary person can understand. Like my, like my, I use my mum as an example that my mum is a, my mum's an ordinary, what she would call an ordinary, just a, a human being like everyone else, but just an ordinary person, you know, no, none of us are really special and have great my mum is just, well, I, she would call herself an ordinary woman. And, <laughs> And so my goal has always been, can I take a subject that could be complicated and articulate it in such a way in writing and verbally that my mum could totally understand? And you go, I totally get that. And so that's always been my guiding principle when I write my books and, and when I, I, I talk about things is it, it can't be too intellectual. It can't be too cerebral and mathematical. It has to be in a, it has to be a language. So I've always believed that I've been, I'm an interpreter, mm. not just not interpreting Spanish to English or, or, you know, German to Chinese or anything like that, but interpreting the worlds of science uh, to people who are not scientists and also interpreting the world of spirituality to scientists and to people who don't get spirituality. Yes. So I'm very comfortable way over there in the hard mathematical sciences. I love immersing myself in the deepest feelings and experiences of spirituality. And I'm very comfortable floating between the two. And so I feel my purpose is to translate this to these people and to translate this to these people and, and also hover wherever I'm needed at that particular time. So that's kind of what I see my role at the moment being. That's Exactly right, which is why everybody needs to get why woo-woo works. And I feel like, 
Yeah, exactly. Look at that beautiful <laughs> book. If you're seeing, next time. Um, I just got that, got that. That that just got that advanced copy. So cool. It's a beautiful cover. I can't wait for people to pick it out. It's um, out September twenty first. So, yeah. yeah, exciting. And you are you are a bridge between two worlds. And I believe that this next phase in our evolution. Obviously, we are very polarized right now um, in every area of society and. I think everybody that I interview on this podcast serves as a bridge in their world and you do it so beautifully. You're such like, you just embody kindness and love and positivity and humor and lightness of being. But like you said, you're so grounded and rooted and just really advanced, uh, you know, understanding of, of science and spirituality. So um, where can people find you to learn more and to pick up this book? Uh, well, my website, drdavidhamilton.com. That's a kind of guide to everything else. I'm on all the social media, so Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and I write lots of blogs for my website. I, I'm on YouTube. I, I, I'm, I, I do lots of videos for social media and stuff like that. So I'm always at a bit... My, my website probably is easiest access to everything else that I sort of do and stuff. So And I'm, all my books are on Amazon and everywhere else. Okay, cool. Well... Thank Everybody, you. go get Why Woo Woo Works. Uh, if you're a skeptic or if you're a believer, it's going to strengthen your belief in what's possible. And um, thank you so much for being on the Heal Podcast. Is there anything you that you feel compelled coming up to to leave with our audience? Uh, just, just given given the the polarities of the world at the moment, just be kind because it's almost always the right thing to do. Let that be your guiding before you speak, before you fire off an email or a comment or something. Let kindness be your guiding principle. Be kind. It's almost always the right thing to do. It's, it's that which taps you into the underlying flow, not intellectually. Don't get confused with the intellectual thinking, I know this, that, the next thing. It's the felt experience of the not, the actual flow of, of saying unbounded love itself and I think it's kindness that taps you into that so be kind it's almost always the right thing to do uh, I love that and and please include yourself in that kindness we'll absolutely good end good ending Kelly exactly <laughs> include yourself as well the hardest part exactly for most of us exactly thank you so much again so great to see you and um good luck with the book thank you and it's been great to see you too and hang out like this Kelly thanks very much Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.